Father, great is your faithfulness and your love. May the spirit of the Lord transform our lives today. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. I don't know if you know this. In Webster Miriam's dictionary, or Miriam Webster, I don't know what it is. Whatever. In the dictionary, hangry is a word in the dictionary. Hangry. Now, I know you all know what hangry means. Amen? I know that most of you probably have been hangry at one time or another. If you are married, maybe your spouse has been hangry one time or another. I'm not outing my spouse. I'm just not going to out my spouse. (laughs) She can watch online. But, you know, like, hangry is where if you don't know, if you are not from earth, hangry is combination, hungry, angry. Do you guys remember about a decade ago, there were Snickers commercials that was sort of based off the idea of being hangry? And for example, there was one where Aretha Franklin is in the back, if you know who Aretha Franklin is. She's sitting in the back of this car of four and they're driving. And Aretha Franklin is complaining about her friend up front who's driving. And the friend right next to her said, hey, that's not right. So gives the Snickers. And like magically, once they take a bite of the Snickers, it turns back to the guy. And they're like, hey, why are you being such a diva? You know, do you guys remember this commercial? There's also one where they're all playing football Just, you know, a pickup game, playing football out in the mud. And they have Betty White running around trying to get a pass. You know who will be looking like this for a while? Pastor Michael. I'm sorry. I just told him I was going to. Is it too soon? I'm sorry, Pastor Michael. But I told you I was going to do it. So she's running like this. And then she's complaining to the quarterback. And they give give her, because it's still Betty White, a Snickers. And then it turns into this guy, you know. Saying, and the tagline is, you're not you when you're hungry. You're not you when you're hungry. I want to go to the text. So the text that I was given, I probably normally wouldn't be excited about preaching. But I'm going to read the text and then, I'll, and then we'll go over it. So it's back to verse 16. It says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. For they disfigure their faces to show that they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Not many people get excited about about preaching about fasting. It's not sexy. Yay, I want to preach about fasting. And not too many people get excited about fasting. How many of you ever fasted before? Is it fun? It's usually not fun. It's, some, it's usually something that you got to grit and bear to, oh, I got to finish this. I said I was going to fast for exactly 24 hours. I'm going to do it. I'm going to fast three days. There's even a sort of a science to this, like what to expect while you're fasting. Sort of the same way of like withdrawal, denial, all this kind of stuff. Like that's the science of fasting. And I wonder if Jesus here is saying that you're pretending to do this when you fast. You're just putting on a show. If you look at the context of this, if you look at the context of Matthew chapter 6, right before the fasting is the prayer. Right before that, it says, And when you pray, do not look like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues. Right before that, it says, Be careful not to do your righteous acts before men to be seen by them. If you do, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. Don't be a show. Let me ask you a question. Elevate. Gulp. 
Are you a show? Do we do what we do as a show? I'm not calling, because I haven't been here long enough, but I used to, I worked at Pacific Union College for the last about four years before I got, I got here. And we had a college service on campus. And we had a regular, all college students that came, regular 150 that come. And I asked the students, I said, I love the worship service. What are you outside of that one hour? Are you a show? Our lives transformed by people being associated with you. If not, then all we're doing is singing up front. Lives need to be changed. They need to be transformed. We are not a show. Now, again, to the context, forgiveness. But the real context, the bigger context of this is this is in the heart of the Sermon on the Mount. And then in the Sermon on the Mount, he starts, Jesus starts and says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. And that word blessed is happy. Do you see the contradiction here? Why are you acting, acting somber? Why are you sad? I just told you happy are those who are poor in spirit, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who are peacemakers, who are persecuted for my name's sake. You want to be happy? Do you really want to be happy? This is happiness. So why are you acting sad? The Christian is not sad. We have made Christianity sad. And we're going to get to this in a little bit. Go to the next slide about fasting. Truly, fasting is about freedom. We have made fasting about bondage. And there's two main parts to this that are really associated with Jewish fasting. Shabbat, what we in English call Sabbath, and Teshuvah which I'll tell you now, it means repentance. But here's the irony. Shabbat, if you grew up Adventist in a fairly traditional home, a lot of times Sabbath was not a joy because we made it bondage. Ironically, you think about the Jewish people that were just, the Israelites were just released out of bondage in Egypt And God says to them, hey, there's going to be a day, and I'm going to enforce this. There's going to be a day that you will not work. You've been working 16-hour days, seven days a week, because you were a slave. You are free. You are not a slave. Say this, I am not a slave. Could you imagine that first Sabbath? Like, what do we do? I don't know. Sleep in. Hang out, light candles, sing, eat, like spend time with our family. This was a day of joy. Yet after years, it became a day of bondage. The Jewish people said, no, 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 no. There's not enough rules surrounding this. And Adventists have followed suit. This day of joy Sometimes is a day of bondage. But we are not slaves. You're not slaves to work. And fasting, you're not slaves to food. Even though sometimes I feel like it. You're not slaves to the past. Let's go to the Shabbat. Isaiah 58 says this, and I've seen this as, used as a proof text via some of our Bible studies, it says this, verse 13. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord and I will cause you to ride on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob, the mouth of the Lord is spoken. 
we have interpreted this at times. If you can suffer through the Sabbath and not make it joyful, then God's happy. Ironically, we have lost the whole context of this. I want to read you the context. Sorry, you're going to have to just bear with me as I read this. Isaiah 58 sort of connects Shabbat and fasting here. And it says this in verse 3. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Meaning, why did we go through all that sacrifice? God, you didn't notice this? Yet, On the day of your fasting, you do as you please. You exploit all your workers. You have made the Shabbat and your fasting all about you. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife. How many of you ever woke up and like there was a fight on the way to church? And you're striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it not? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is it only about you? Is that, the, is that what you call a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? Now, here's God responding. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Is this not? To loose the chains of injustice to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, to break every yoke, to share food with the hungry, to provide the poor wanderer with shelter. When you see the naked, to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. I'm going to stop there. The Sabbath is joyful Because it's about serving others. Fasting is a time where we get to remember other people. A lot of times we have used Sabbath and fasting about us. But really it's about serving and making other lives better. I mean, think about it. You know, Jesus is sitting at the well. The woman just left her pot of water. She's so excited. The disciples get back and they're excited because they are bringing food. Like, oh, he's going to love this. I don't know what it was. Maybe some Thai food. Doesn't Thai food sound good? Oh, I love Thai food. Some drunken noodles. Is that making you hungry yet? Some masaman curry. Okay, sorry. Oh, it's so good. You need to fast. But so... So they bring back their food and they say, Jesus, you need to eat some. You haven't eaten in a long time. And Jesus says, okay, give it to me. I'm tearing into it. No. He says, I have food that you don't even know about. I'm so excited right now. I can't even eat. Because there's a woman that has come to the throne of grace through my interaction. And it's not just her. The whole Sumerian town is coming. They're going to know Jesus. I don't got time to eat. But we look at fasting as, I got to suffer through this because God will accept me more. I do wonder if the problem, why are you so somber? is because in our heart of hearts, we really don't want to sacrifice to help other people. I actually wonder if, you know where it says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing? It's not just about the show. Is he saying, don't let your left hand know because he'll try to talk your right hand out of doing it. Just like Ananias and Sapphira. They were like, yes, we want to donate to the church. And then as they talked, they're like, well, maybe we only donate a little. But we still look good. Shabbat is about sacrifice to serve others, making other lives better. Secondly is Teshuvah. 
Now, I told you early on, teshuva means to repent. The root word is shuv. Did you catch that? I didn't expect you to. Shuv, to turn. And this shuv, this teshuva, is so key to the Jewish thought, to turn back to God. And you would do this continuously, but the real teshuva happens one day a year during Yom Kippur. Do you guys know, have you heard of Yom Kippur? Yom Kippur in English is what? Day of Atonement. Literally, Yom Day. Kafar means to cover. The day of covering. And the way that I look at it, because it is really about reconciliation with God, is if there is something between me and you, we need something to bridge that. Do you, have you ever seen this on TV? I've never seen this in real life. But on TV, where like really olden days, where if there was a woman and she wanted to get across the street and there was a big puddle, that a man would be so honorable to take off his jacket and lay it on the puddle. That man would not be me. I'll say, good luck. Walk around the puddle. But, you know, that's sort of the, the chivalry, you know. Oh, I would lay my jacket there. I look at that as Kippur. I'm bridging that gap. I'm taking away obstacles. Now, what's great about Yom Kippur is God took care of it. This is why it should have been a day of joy. But if you understand, if you study the history of Yom Kippur within Judaism, is it became a day where you would recount your sins and you would go over and it became a day of stress and anxiety. But really, God is saying, I took care of it. Is that gospel? Is that gospel? God took care of it? Amen. But here's the problem. God took care of that. But what if we have something? What if we have issue? Now, Jewish thought is a little bit different with re restoration that happens between us. Teshuva. If I've wronged you, I am expected to restore you. If I've stolen from you, then I restore it. You know, the idea of eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, all that literally means, it's not about revenge, it means my eye is the same value as your eye. My tooth, the same value. So if you knock out my tooth, you must pay me the value of my tooth. That's what it means. We're of equal value, so you must restore. Here's the problem. Why so somber? We don't like to sacrifice and we actually struggle with restoration. How many of you got kids? How easy is it to have your kids say they're sorry to each other? I mean, kids even have a hard time go, oh, I gotta say I'm sorry. But imagine how much harder if they have to pay back what they have broken or stolen. To close, the beauty of this story, there's a story and I'm not going to read it. It's just a story that there's a man who honors both Shabbat and Teshuvah together. The, the real heart of fasting. A man who is up in a tree looking. Whoa. Man, she is always listening. Looking for the Lord. And as the Lord walked by, he said, what's the name? Zacchaeus. What did he say? You come down. For what? Do you not know this song? For I'm going to your house today. Right. Now, as you read the story, thank you for singing it for me. That's what I was looking for. But if you look at the end of the story, Zacchaeus says this. First, I'm going to give half of everything. I know I've wronged a lot of people. I'm giving half of everything to the poor. That's often, you know, half. And then secondly, if I've wronged anybody, and this is the heart of Teshuvah, if I've wronged anybody, I'm giving them four times as much. 
This is what the spirit that God wants us to have in fasting. It's all about other people and restoration of relationships. May we, may you embrace fasting.